Hi, my name's Connor Delaney. I'd like to welcome everybody to another episode of MD Insight. And I'm proud to be here today with uh, Dr. Steve Gordon. Steve is the Chair of Infectious Disease uh, at Cleveland Clinic. And we've uh, worked and collaborated together for many years, but we've had kind of a, a different collaborative relationship over the last couple of months. Steve, thank you for being here. Um, and maybe actually that might be a good way to kick off, talk a little bit about what's changed for infectious disease since March. Yeah, well, well thank you, Connor. And it, it is a pleasure to be here and, uh, you know, to, to just have a conversation about COVID-19. I, I think, um, obviously, this has changed everyone's lives. I mean, if we think back just five months ago, um, most of us were enjoying the holidays. Maybe some heard about this uh, case of unusual pneumonia in a Chinese hospital in a place called Wuhan. Uh, and then fast forward, uh, and truly fast forward. So what we have obviously seen is a pandemic. If you were writing a kind of a Michael Crichton uh, novel on bio threats, this has all the players. You've got a, a new virus, uh, something that is readily transmissible person to person. And in this era of supersonic travel, obviously the diaspora that we've seen, uh, and again, a myriad of presentations. Uh, but, but we've never had a situation, I mean, truly unprecedented, the effect that this has had globally, obviously, uh, as well as we can't forget the individuals. Um, you know, as you know, the U.S. just crossed that 100,000 mortality threshold around the time of Memorial Day. Uh, but also, uh, you know, it reminds me of the Flanders uh, flowers as well, the poppy. Uh, it, you know, this is a time to reflect that this has had real morbidity and mortality. Uh, in effect. I, I do think that there's optimism down the line, but um, as you know, this is something that we are going to continue to struggle with and manage, uh, at least in the pre-protective era, for I would estimate another year or a year and a half. Yeah, uh, I think it'll be here with us for a while for sure. I think one of the interesting things, Steve, watching it evolve has been the dashboards, you know, the international dashboard, things like that have been looking at numbers and yes, 100,000 deaths is a huge number. Um, a lot of them have been flat numbers, you know, of countries versus the U.S. And you think of the U.S. versus Europe, some a little more, bit more sophisticated are talking about rates. But it brings in a lot of complexity, whether people are testing, what tests are using, you know, are rates in Africa really that low or is it just they're not testing at all? And all, all of those are factors. So testing kind of becomes critical. And, and what are your thoughts about, you know, how we how we manage that moving forward? That's a great question, Connor. I think, you know, there's the old saying that you really can't manage what you can't measure. And uh, initially when we were uh, potentially a little myopic and tagging this to travel, um, so you had a geo tag on travelers either to Wuhan or coming from Asia, um, then you could apply maybe some, you know, interesting kind of up from screening. But obviously, um, as we've known more about COVID, there is no geo tags anymore. In the clinical presentations, which was focused initially on the sick patients presenting with an acute lung injury, so fever, cough, shortness of breath, with or without infiltrates on chest x-rays or CTs, um, as we've been able to test more and see the, the myriad of presentations, it's truly humbling. I mean, as an ID person, uh, you know, this, this virus has brought us, any hubris is gone, and we're seeing different presentations, as you know, uh, obviously the loss of taste and a loss of smell now, uh, ring bells in all of us, the GI presentation, skin manifestations. And now, of course, the frightening but small numbers of this polyinflammatory syndrome in pediatrics. To your point about testing, therefore, I'm not that good of a clinician to be able to distinguish, uh, you know, is it COVID? Um, and remember, in a few months, we'll be at least north of the Austral in cold and flu season. So how are you going to distinguish that between RSV, influenza, when we know treatments and management will be different? So testing not only for COVID becomes important, but thinking in the future, testing to get a multiplex platform for the other common uh, you know, respiratory diseases is also top of mind. To that end on testing though, and there've been many written about, um, you know, this has been one of the postmortems that will be written about is, is not just the, the kind of the failed CDC introduction of, of the test, uh, but also now where is the testing capacities? Um, we have enough acutely, but this is a, a virus that is going to be transmitted primarily in households in the community. And there's still a bunch of vulnerable people who, who have kind of been locked down. You know, we don't think we have anywhere near what we'd call the threshold of exposure for herd, herd immunity, which would be closer to 60%. So we're going to have this kindling out there 
that we're going to have to continually to be managed um, as uh, new infections and clusters will continue. Without the ability for community testing, um, I think we'll be hampered. And more importantly, it's got to be like an Uber. It can't run through an order from me or from for you. It's got to be something ideally that would be self-administered with rapid turnaround time, low barriers, uh, obviously, for uh, processing the pre-analytics, and then actionable data on that in terms of isolation uh, versus quarantine and contact tracing. And I think when you think of the community and getting back to function, testing also becomes important. And um, I think as physicians, hopefully we all realize that, you know, if you have a test and it's negative and you're exposed two days later, you can have a test four days later that's positive. So what are your thoughts about how we responsibly or sensibly use testing, you know, as companies are trying to get back to work? Uh, maybe as we get on planes, should there be point of care testing before you get on a long flight or, you know, it, it, the test is only valid for as long as you couldn't be exposed again. So how do you think we should implement it as society? Obviously, there has to be more testing so we know prevalence. And I get all of the comments about flu versus rhinovirus versus this. But you know, from, a, from getting back to normal perspective, how do we fit it in? Or where should we fit it in? So it's great. I, I think you know, if we had unlimited capacity, or it, it, wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be an issue. And hopefully, we'll get there. Uh, but for now, then we have to realize, what is the test being used for? And in, in how is that going to inform other decision making? So for us in an acute care facility where we have other vulnerable patients that are not COVID infected, this could be your cancer patients or post-operative patients, obviously um, that becomes a different level of barrier in terms of knowing status uh, as patients are coming in. So they don't expose other patients or other healthcare providers. Uh, and so that's one use of testing going on now. So in the States, it's estimated that there's 100,000 tests being done on admissions or preoperative patients. Uh, low prevalence in that subset, but high consequences in terms of if you miss somebody. Um, then you can move on, and, and as you stated, um, if you're exposed, uh, whether you know or not, um, testing up front um, may or may not be informative, um, unless you're in a household where you could have been the source that has recovered. Uh, but then we are going to move it on towards more symptomatic testing after that, within that incubation period. So we, as you know, healthcare providers, if I'm exposed, um, not symptomatic, I can still go to work, so to speak, uh, with, cloth, with my cloth covering using PPE. But if I develop any symptoms, very low threshold to stay home and then get tested. Uh, and that's how that's being used. Um, but you, you raise a good point. If I am on the uh, a laborer on the Ford Motor Company, and let's say I'm next to you, and all of a sudden you start coughing, you might go home, but I probably, or we'd probably want to know, is it COVID or something else? Because that might also inform subsequent testing or also cohorting or quarantining. And at this point, we don't have that capacity um, to do that type of testing, although I do think that's going to come hopefully within the next several months. And what about flights or international flights? Do you think there'll be, when, when there's obviously testing available, do you think we'll be testing before getting on flights or will be yeah. people be using masks and hygiene or what do you think? Yeah, so right now I think I haven't flown in the COVID era, but I know that it's, it's, it's you know, it's probably the, one of the safer places to be because uh, masking is obviously uh, required. The flights are less crowded. Uh, they've done some, what we'd say, some you know structural things in terms of seating, uh, and then of course you get your temperature checks. Um, and most people again are wearing that protection. There are some airlines I know, such as I believe it's the Emirates, where they mm -hmm. are using the Abbott uh, in the waiting room in, right. in certain culprits. Uh, but as you pointed out, a negative test doesn't mean you couldn't be incubating, and so it's not all about the test there. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're beginning to see even home testing. Um, you know, so it, these will be ELISA's kind of like pregnancy testing. They won't necessarily have the highest sensitivity, but nonetheless, um, I think you're going to see more and more things pushed out and that could be used even as a screening, um, to get more testing done in the communities for, for people who fear they, they may or may not have symptoms. Yeah, it's actually, it's really become a fascinating disease. You mentioned earlier on about some of the various manifestations and clinical side, but the social side, the testing side, there's so much in it. So one of the other big things obviously being discussed at the moment is antibody testing. You know, whether false positive, false negative, immunity passports. What are your thoughts on where we're going to end up with antibody testing? 
So if you think about it, when we talk about uh, respiratory viruses and RNA respiratory viruses, we, we've never had a what I call a antibody test uh, that informs the individual either on what I would say immunity, that is a correlate of protection from, from the infection, uh, nor diagnosis. So when we think of something like influenza, there have been serial surveys done at the population level, but only to estimate exposure. And the same thing I believe currently is with uh, COVID-19. So recently there have been several ser serial surveys published in different populations. And not surprisingly, if you look at New York City and London, so big metropolis areas, a lot of international travel, a lot of exposure, mm -hmm. based upon, again, uh, just uh, what we'd say antibody testing of populations, it looks like it's about 20 to 30 percent of those areas. Contrast that to some place like Cleveland, where it's probably more like five to seven percent. Boston was like 10%. So that informs, I think, what I would say exposure. But for an individual, uh, there is no value in spending, I think online now, it's $119 for the antibody test. Uh, that is not gonna inform you about protection or diagnosis. So it's the diagnostic test that we really talk about. And to date, that means something that is gonna be stuck in your mouth, in your nose, uh, although they are looking at, at spit and saliva testing uh, as well as diagnostic testing. Steve, moving on a little bit to treatment. Um, obviously, a lot of the treatment for patients with um, severe COVID is supportive, respiratory, others. But from specific antiviral treatment, obviously some early trials coming out. But you know, again, thinking forward six months, a year or more, do you think there'll be a specific antiviral for it? Or what direction do you think therapeutics will go in? So great queries. A lot of uh, a lot of research in uh, in in not just the diagnostic aspect, but but in terms of antiviral treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're right. Initially, uh, despite the wave of hydroxychloroquine, the plaquenil, the azithromycin, um, the only evidence-based support up until recently for COVID is supportive care for those that are hospitalized. Remember, 80 to 90 percent of people will not require medical attention. Uh, and certainly not be hospitalized, but obviously of those hospitalized, a certain percentage um, will go to the ICU and of those obviously higher mortality rates. Um, right now, I think that the number one antiviral that, that is looking very good is remdesivir. So this is a Gilead Science uh, product. It was initially developed for Ebola. It actually does affect the RNA polymerase. It's called the quote unquote terminator. Um, three trials have been published. Uh, the most recent was the randomized control trial here in the States, although international. And what that showed is the endpoint looked at was actually time to recovery. These are all patients that had pneumonia or hypoxia. And what it shows was those that received remdesivir probably had four days uh, earlier time to recovery to find his discharge to home or, to, or out of the hospital. No signal for mortality, um, although uh, obviously, uh, you know, that, that, was, that would have been a home run. But again, promising, and now that drug is being pushed out. Uh, we have it here at the clinic and in most places through the government. And again, so I think that's the big one right now. Other things that are being looked at, uh, but no data, the convalescent plasma. So this gets to that passive immunization. We've used convalescent plasma for over 100 years in medicine. Uh, obviously, this is the, the part of the blood harvested from uh, survivors that don't have the platelets or the red cells, the immunoglobulin. That is being looked at as a prophylaxis, early treatment, and for salvage treatment. To date, I don't have any uh, reports of, of obviously randomized controlled trials, just small little series uh, which uh, show maybe there's a benefit. So we'll wait for that. But the bigger thing I think we're holding our hat on in this pre-protective era is vaccines. Right. And, and of course, That's my next question. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that that is the most exciting. Um, and again, I think this is also something that is, it's kind of like machine learning. If you remember, we go back to the other pandemic coronavirus or potential ones, SARS and MERS. Um, there was a lot of effort there in terms of trying to stand up a potential vaccine. And with SARS, it just kind of disappeared. But that same technology that platforms have been used to stand up similar vaccines for COVID-19. So when we look at what we call the adenoviral vector vaccine, so this is using the cold virus as the vector, inserting a little piece of the genetic material for that spike protein on the coronavirus that then is injected and then uh, replicates and then we get a good immune response. That was the same platform for the MERS and the SARS. Um, so Oxford Jenner in the UK, you've got Canosino uh, in China, and you've got Janssen in the States, all of them 
have needles in the arms in phase one to phase three, and there are reports of good correlates of protection. And I, I think you saw that bump in Wall Street maybe last week for yeah. Moderna, but that's a different platform. So that's an mRNA vaccine. We've never had one. Uh, that cuts through a lot of the issues with a lot of difficulties in production. And again, in a small phase one, good signal uh, in terms of protective correlates of protection. Uh, and so that platform is also moving forward. It's my opinion that we're going to need more than one platform as we have other types of vaccine platforms. Uh, but these are all promising. On the other hand, I wouldn't expect widespread vac uh, widespread distribution of a successful vaccine until next summer. So we will be, uh, we would all think at least another year in what we call this pre-protective era where coronavirus will still be present, we'll still have large swaths of, of non-immune um, people that will be potentially um, obviously infected with COVID-19. And Steve, so think about flu and flu vaccines. It's different every year, virus slightly different, vaccine changes. Uh, how quick do you think this virus is going to change? Do you think it'll be one vaccine forever like polio? Or do you think it's going to be changing every year and modified to the virus specifically? Yeah. Another great question. So corona, the, the coronavirus family is an RNA virus. And by definition, RNA, RNA viruses are not very fidelity and replication. Right. We think about HIV, as you mentioned, influenza. As it turns out, the coronaviruses in general are fairly a fidelity. So there's mutations, but the mutation rate has been very small. Now, your point is a great one. They are tracking mutations in subsets of sequencing from isolates all over the world. And in particular, they're looking at, the, at, at those that affect the spike protein because that spike protein is being used as um, a template for immunogenicity for vaccine as well as diagnostics. And so that will inform, obviously, um, efficacy potentially, and also as well as drug development, as well as vaccine development. So that type of surveillance is being looked at. And I will add is that that type of surveillance was built on the backbone of the global influenza surveillance program that was really funded and set up after our last pandemic uh, of H1N1. So as you know, and we all know, these things just don't come out of air that it requires a lot of investment in terms of basic research surveillance and then the preparedness is usually what god favors uh it's good to be lucky too um but but i think all of this is making us reassess our investments in just basic research and understanding yeah preparedness is important Steve, you mentioned the 100,000 deaths and the consequence. Obviously, this is, this is a very significant virus with significant consequences. Every now and again, and, and we met somebody socially distantly appropriately over the weekend, and, and they said, well, you know, 80,000 people died this year from the flu, um, which is higher than average, but it's 80,000 flu deaths. This is only 100 coronavirus deaths. What do you say to the people who say, hey, we've overreacted, this wasn't a real crisis, and apart from one or two cities, you know, many countries in the U.S. have done okay. What, what are your, how, how do we educate people? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, but Connor, I would, I would go back to our clinical, um, you know, our, you know, as physicians, we sometimes don't help patients, but, but we, we try to at least alleviate suffering and comfort. And one of the things, obviously, uh, in terms of, of practicing during the era of COVID, we've seen true isolation, not just isolation of the patients with COVID, but actually death with isolation. And, and that is something I think that really rings all of our hearts, that, that absence of closure, uh, to not be able to you know, be there as a clinician and provide those words of comfort directly to the family member, hold the hand of the patient. Uh, and so I think that has affected us at the front lines the physicians, the nurses in watching this uh, move forward. The other thing is, of course, this has not affected everyone equally. Um, COVID-19 has actually stripped away many of what we would say the social determinants of health um, in terms of whom it's affecting and severely. A lot of this has to do with not biology, but actually um, access to healthcare potentially, or the issue of how many people in the household uh, and so these are all things that are being studied uh, and potentially not surprising. For many of us, COVID-19 has been an inconvenience. Maybe you work at home and things of this nature. For other people, obviously, um, it, it's, it's been a different story. They've, they've had to go out there or have not been able to, what we would say, socially distance because of 
certain factors. So I think the social issues here are, are going to be also important, not to blame blame to somebody, but to actually reassess and see, okay, what can we do better in terms of not just delivering healthcare, but also social services and, and preparedness for wellness? Yeah, absolutely. And I've certainly been trying to message that one of the reasons in a way it's not so bad or certainly not as bad as some of the initial modeling curves that we saw is that people have been pretty careful and, and people, society closed down and variable in different cities, different countries. But we probably can't replicate that amount of social closing, society closing again. So that's why we have to be careful as we reopen. No, and I think the other thing that you've taught us and others is you don't have to be infected to be affected. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, the cancer screenings, the colonoscopies, the delay in treatment, um, and now even uh, a, a kind of interruption of childhood vaccines, all this is going to have consequences uh, in terms of, of the effect of either fear to get care or, or absence of, of getting care and things of this nature. And I know you've, you've spoken on that as well in terms of, you know, obviously in, that's a big kind of book of business for you is prevention and cancer screening. So, I, you know, you might want to add to that in, in terms of, uh, you know, you, we always say you don't want to die of embarrassment in terms of getting that colonoscopy. But, but this is having different, different effects, I believe, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, one more question as we close, and that is, you know, where you think we're going moving forward? Obviously, healthcare, we never quite closed down. We're opening up. Patients need care. There will be various industries that will get back. They may change workflows, where people stand, how they quite work. Restaurants will open up a percentage. It will depend on the volume of customers they can have. It's going to be tough for them. But there's some industries, and it's, it's really harder to see how we can do it, at least at least pre-vaccine, uh, pre-effective vaccine that's widespread, like cinema, like 20 or 100,000 people in a sports stadium, things like that. Where do you think society is going to go with that? Yeah, so those are all great questions. I do think there's opportunity here, right? I mean, um, in, for some of these areas, even for us, we're looking at maybe there's more effective, efficient ways of delivering care. Maybe for many patients, we can deliver effective care um, uh, and craft more what we would say uh, flexibility for the provider and the patient in terms of delivering um, uh, distant health or synchronous or asynchronous situations, which I think will be positive. There should be no more reason to have school closures for snow days. Uh, you think about the effect of education in this yeah. regard. Um, you know, you think about other opportunities in terms of reducing traffic and things of this nature to have the hybrid commuting model um, in all these environmental footprints. So I think th those are things. But I would state this is that if I was king and I'm not, um, one of the things I'd be investing in post COVID is infrastructure and not in roads, but in 5G and internet and making that kind of like a, a utility for the public. Uh, because I do believe that that will create new innovation and new opportunities. Some industries may go by the wayside, but if we think about all the new ones that, that can be created. In terms of sports, I know that I understand that there's a lot of people waking up at 2 a.m. watching Korean baseball uh, at 2 a.m. in the States. Now, I'm not criticizing Korean baseball, but obviously there is an appetite. And, um, you know, having talked to some of the sports teams and things, I think for me, being outside um, is, is safer. So the solution in some ways is dilution. And I know that, um, you know, that people are looking at those aspects. For indoor congregate activities, it's still a caveat there. Um, and, and so I think there'll have to be different innovative ways in terms of how to, put, how to produce certain products. Um, but I think in terms of what we can do now and what you're seeing is outdoor eating areas. New York is actually changing some legislation to get the tables in the streets, open the windows, if you're going to pray, you know, outdoor prayers under tents and no matter what you're, you're doing. So I think there are smart ways of reducing risk in terms of that mitigation. And I think we're going to see a lot of creative solutions. Humans are very good at, uh, as you know, innovation. And, and so I really look, look forward to other businesses also showing us, wow, I never thought about that. That's interesting. So I'm uh, optimistic. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it'll end up being a very traumatic time, uh, complicated. It's taken a lot of work to get over it, but it's, it'll redefine our future and it's incredibly exciting. Steve, I, I just want to thank you so much for taking time to chat today. Uh, it's a pleasure as always, but uh, learning from you is, is fantastic and uh, appreciate it. 
Oh, God, I want to thank you. And thank for all, thanks for all your leadership in terms of for us, the organization. Uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's just always wonderful to have a wonderful colleague like you. So thank you and, and thank you to the audience. We're lucky to have a, a good team and it's a great team game. So thanks again, Steve. Appreciate it.